Hello, welcome everyone to today's live webinar. I'm Amissa, Marketing Manager here at Upkeep, and I'm pretty excited about today's webinar titled Beyond Basics, Upkeep's Guide to Maintenance Maturity Levels 3 and 4. Before we dive into the webinar, let's review a few ways that you all can participate during the webinar. So if you have any questions, you can type them into the little question mark icon feature. Also, if you want to comment on anything, you can click on the chat icon and post your comments there. We will be asking questions during the webinar and we'll be looking for your responses in the chat. Uh, we also are going to have Q&A time at the end and we'll be looking at the question features for questions to, to answer. Okay, so let's uh, do our normal webinar routine here and practice using the chat feature. So everyone that's here, uh, click on the chat icon and let us know where you are joining us from. So I am in a, a small town called Klamath Falls, Oregon, if any of you know where that is. Brian, where are you at? I'm in Havity Grace, Maryland, and I see Ahmed is here. Ahmed is a good friend of Upkeep. <clears throat> From Mississippi. No, he's from uh, Canada. Oh, oh, I didn't read. I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> Mississauga, Mississauga. I, I, my, is, is uh, that one. I, my comments were partially blocked. I couldn't read it. I'll let you guys read them. <laughs> That's funny. Midland, Texas. I've been there. Garrett, where are you at? I am in Fort Collins, Colorado. Nice. Okay. Nice. North Carolina, Canada. Awesome. Arizona, Mexico, wow, Tampa. I always really find it amazing on how many people we have joined our webinars from all over the world, Ooh, not just Brazil. in the U.S. And I love yeah. that. Yeah. Well, uh, looks like you guys are accustomed to using the chat feature, so thank you so much all for joining us. Um, so I'm happy to introduce our speakers today, including myself, Brian and Garrett. Brian, can you please introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I'm Brian. I'm the head of community and partnerships for Upkeep. Um, I've been a mechanic, a field mechanic, a maintenance manager, a director of maintenance and reliability, a maintenance uh, leader for multiple organizations. I was in the Navy as a flight deck troubleshooter, um, been a consultant, all kinds of things. So glad to be here. Go ahead, Garrett. Thanks, Brian. Hello, my name is Garrett Sapansky, and I am a senior customer success manager here uh, with Upkeep. I've been with the company for two years now, and um, my background in CMMS goes back for a total of six. Um, I've functioned as a customer success manager, level two support agents as well uh, with other CMMSs. And um, I do reside in the state of Colorado and specifically in Fort Collins. Awesome. And I also um, gained my CMRP certification back in October as well. Yes, All right, take it over to uh, Amissa. Yeah. Um, and so, like I said, I'm Amissa, marketing manager here at Upkeep. I've been with Upkeep for almost two years, and uh, like Garrett, recently became CMRP certified through SMRP. Um, and just to give you a little context, like way, way earlier in my working career, um, I actually worked as a manufacturing technician in a semiconductor plant. And so I do remember what it was like to operate the, that equipment and what happened when we had an unexpected downtime event. It was a big deal. Um, so I am familiar with, with uh, th that type of stuff. Um, so for today's webinar, first we'll dive into an overview of what the maintenance maturity model is. Then we're going to go over level three of the maintenance maturity model and discuss this, the key steps in having a successful CMMS adoption. And then after that, we're going to look closely at level four of the maintenance maturity model, which is about creating reliable maintenance data and defining KPIs for advanced maintenance operating efficiencies um, and using those KPIs to make informed decisions. So we created the maintenance maturity model to help teams evaluate where they are currently at and what steps are needed to get to the ultimate goal of a world-class maintenance program. So the five levels are number one, from pen and paper to CMMS, 
So at this level, a team is still using paper and pencil to track maintenance tasks. Generally, one person fields phone calls, writes the call notes on paper, assigns work orders through another phone call or with paper jobs. Also, this team often uses spreadsheets to manage day-to-day -day scheduling. Level two uh, is what we're calling CMMS implementation. So at this level, a team has achieved a successful basic implementation of a computerized maintenance management system. And the team has identified how they will use their CMMS um, implemented workflows and they've rolled it out to their end users. Uh, level three, uh, which we will be talking about today is what we're calling successful CMMS adoption. Um, so the team is using their CMMS to understand what they need to work on and beginning to gain valuable insights into how they can become more efficient. Level four, reliable data and defined KPIs. Um, historical data is used to understand where and how the team is spending their time, which assets require the most attention, and what the ultimate impact of the bottom line is. And then level five, where everyone aspires to be, world-class maintenance. So the success at this level is no longer just about the number of work orders completed, but also about managing and maintaining the uptime of equipment. So um, I mentioned it, but today's webinar, we're gonna be focusing on level three and four, um, and join us next month in March to learn about level five. So we're gonna, uh, where we all aspire to be. So let's dive into level three. So at level three, maintenance teams have taken the steps to move away from managing maintenance work manually through spreadsheets and pen and paper. They've implemented a, a computerized maintenance management system. And now in level three, it's time to fully utilize the CMMS and all its capabilities to improve your team's operations. We want to empower you all to aim for maintenance operational efficiency so that your team can be viewed by other business units as a, reven a revenue contributor rather than a cost center. So step one to fully utilize your C existing CMMS is to assess where you currently are at with your system. So some important things to evaluate are the level at which your team is using and engaging with the tool, looking at which features are being used and not used, and how accurate the data in the system is. Um, I, here, Garrett, I wanna ask you, what is your experience with this step while helping customers? Do you have any tips for us on this? Yes, Samissa, thank you. Um, so, you know, looking over here at the, the key actions list here, I'd like to call out um, the feature utilization review. Um, I think all that the steps are important, but I, I feel that that one holds a lot of weight. Um, I would say, you know, take a look at your CMMS. If you're not using a feature in the product, ask yourself, why is that? Is this a not now or is this a, a not ever going to happen? And then take a phased approach when you go to make the changes um, to the, the CMMS. Awesome. Thanks, Garrett. Um, Brian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, two things. So uh, user engagement analysis, that can be as simple as walking around and talking to people and feeling out what is adding value, what is cumbersome, what's easy, uh, what's efficient, or as complicated as running some form of, um, of report within your CMMS to understand the utilization engagement from things being filled out correctly or not filled out correctly. There's, there's a whole bunch that can be said there. User feedback collection is huge. I mean, that's essentially everything um, that can be derived from looking at man, manpower uh, input into your CMMS, uh, work orders, uh, all, all types of things. So feedback is, uh, is a huge um, benefit and, and that feedback should be cultivated at all times. Like ask, go out, ask, hey, is this working? Is it not working? Uh, and then verify those types of things with the, the utilization. Nice, awesome. Thanks, Brian. So uh, step two uh, is highlighting the need for more robust training and adoption of the tool by your team. So here is where we wanna build the team's confidence in using the tool and their, profic their proficiency through methods such as hands-on workshops and refresher courses. Um, okay. I have a question for the audience, so get ready to click on the chat feature. Um, for those of you that have used and or are using a CMMS, um, has team user adoption been a challenge? If so, how did you overcome it? That's kind of a, a long question to ask, but we really wanna hear your feedback. <clears throat> we got some people typing. Are you seeing any answers in there, Brian? No. Hmm. 
I see people typing. All right, I'll ask it again. We'll give it like one more minute and then we'll move on. But we're curious to know, for those of you that have used and or are using a CMMS, is user adoption uh, been a challenge for you? We have Michael talking about uh, age resistance to change. So buddying mm. people up, right? Tech savvy people connected to people who are not tech savvy, right? That, mm. can, that can always help. Oh yeah. Uh, we have uh, step by step, like you know, going in and, and showing people how to utilize the system step by step. Uh, various capabilities and competencies that seems to be one comfort zone. Tech savvy is mm. a huge one. Techs are reluctant to use it. We don't have any CMMS currently. Upkeep is our first attempt. Evan, great. Oh. I'm in Maryland and I'm an Upkeep employee and I've I've used Upkeep for uh, past uh, businesses where I used it for seven locations uh, around the country managing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment. Um, so if Upkeep's your choice, okay. we got your back. Awesome. Okay, thank you guys for your input. Mostly, it's um, mostly about, uh, about tech being able to use technology. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's that is a key a key thing to overcome. Um, Brian, in your experience, what are some of the key things that can drive a team to fully utilize and adopt uh, a, using a CMMS? Sure. So every single person on here who works in maintenance will understand that you have unique uh, people, unique cultures, unique situations within your maintenance organization. Uh, a lot of those things from the trades, you know, from the people who are doing the work, those things come down to uh, working hours, uh, disgruntledness in the way that there's no change and they're not seeing the things that they want to see changed. And, you know, the first thing to do is to connect those people to why it's so important to leverage and, and integrate with the system. You know, the leadership is not going to just give you a hundred billion dollars to do something that a technician wants you to do. They need to be connected to it. They need to know that the input that they put into the system and the utilization that they provide into the system and from the system is going to allow there to be meaningful data for the necessary people to go and make the arguments for things that they want. So that's one. Two is you have to constantly, constantly, constantly keep the conversation open about its utilization. And that's real time correction of issues. So when I was managing several locations with upkeep, I'd be flying on a plane to one location and I'd be on my phone looking at work orders that technicians were actively in. And I would be texting, sounds micromanaging, but I would text the maintenance manager and I'd be like, hey man, this is wrong. We got to double check. We got to, we got to, we have to compile all these things that we're missing and we need to have training on it. So you want to be correcting things right away because then you don't form any bad habits. And then the technicians will start to see that there's real value in what they're, they're putting into the system. And they'll know that it's being looked at because if it's set and forget, they're going to go, it doesn't matter what I put in here. No one's looking at it. Right. So you, you've got to make sure they're connected to it. They know why it's important and why it is connected to them. And two, you have to have real time corrections to make sure that the appropriate mm -hmm. things are being put in there. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. That's really great. Um, Garrett, what what methods have you found uh, to be the most useful with this step? I'd say the the, the buddy system. Um, okay. Michael Rowe, he, he touched on that earlier in the chat. Um, and, and what I found is that, you know, when rolling out a CMMS, you'll no doubt really have team members that are not tech savvy and find the CMMS intimidating. On the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, you'll you'll have power users. You know, these individuals embrace the software and see it as a tool to help enhance their job. Uh, by pairing these individuals together on jobs, you can help remove blockers and ease misconceptions of the uh, lesser technical worker. Nice. I really like that one, buddying up. All right, so let's move on to step three. This is about communication and more specifically, communicating the goals and objectives of your department with your team and communicating the benefits that have been seen from using the CMMS. So it's important that the team can see how their everyday actions contribute to the goals of the team and 
can see how their work has impacted the team's bottom line in a positive way. This helps foster a culture of understanding and brings the team into alignment with purpose. Um, Garrett, what are your thoughts about this? My thoughts are that this is a very critical, if not the most critical step in the process. Um, it answers the question, that answers the why question. Why is my company doing this? Why should I participate? It creates a sense of purpose and, and belonging. Yeah. Brian, do you have anything now? Yeah, it's very similar. Communicating um, the goals and objectives and aligning everything you do from the uh, discovery session to implementation to adoption to scaling of your CMMS are all connected. People need to know why. People need to know when. People need to be connected to it. And it's just very, it's that simple. Um, and, uh, you know, maintenance and operations, they need to be uh, in symbiosis. So the better communication up and down the chain of command, and then also peer to peer. So department to department um, is all extremely valuable. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Step four of full, fully utilizing your CMMS is about optimizing your workflows. So in step one, you address which features and workflows you're currently using, but now it's time to take it to the next level. So perhaps you need to add in steps to an existing workflow or maybe implement a whole new workflow that you haven't even created yet that's needed for team efficiency. Maybe you'll need to integrate your CMMS with other tools or devices. Um, Garrett, how have you helped clients at this step? Um, at this step, I'm specifically speaking uh, to upkeep uh, software. I have coached them on creating um, labor categories. So inside the Upkeep product, you can go ahead and you take the categories that are used in conjunction with flagging time on a work order, and you can customize those. So some examples uh, to share would be um, inspection time, wrench time, and drive time. Hmm. Okay. And um, Brian, at this level, what are some more advanced workflows that teams should be creating and using to operate? So I'm not going to get into specifics because there's a lot of nuance associated with that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, all of your workflows should mirror how work is done and how work is expected to be done. Um, they sh you shouldn't be having workflows that are uh, unachievable or they're, they are uh, – if you're if you're having everything being automatically approved in your in your request system, but there's no planner or scheduler, that doesn't make any sense, right? So you know th things have to be rooted in reality. They have to be rooted in how work is being completed, executed, you know, planned, scheduled, whatever. Um, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to workflow optimization, but big picture things are just ensure that it's in alignment with reality. If that's yeah. uh, if, uh, just trying to keep it as broad as possible. Yeah. Okay. All right, step five emphasizes the need to foster user engagement by collecting and utilizing feedback from the team. So it's important to collect feedback through user feedback sessions and really dive into some of the challenges they experience so that you can build that positive culture on your team. Um, it's important that your team is heard. Brian, any thoughts about this? 100% agree. Have to, know, have to know, have to take what people say and, and vet it out. Uh, I've been a mechanic, I've been a technician. Um, and when you, what you say, your concerns, the things that matter to your part of the business go fall on deaf ears and there's no follow up, there's no nothing. You immediately want to go, eh, I'm not dealing, you know, they don't care. I don't care. So you have to keep those things in perspective. The people doing the work 100% of the time are going to know the reality of what's happening. We have, we as leaders, we as planners, schedulers, whatever, we have to be in tune with that reality. Yeah. And Garrett, how about you? What comes to mind on this step? Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, echo what Brian said there. I mean, it, it, it's very important to get the feedback and input from uh, not just the technicians, but everyone who touches the CMMS at this stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Step six touches on the importance of continuous support. So at this step, you have regular training sessions, you have access to online resources and a responsive support team. Garrett, what can you tell us about the importance of continuous support? I'm sorry, I'm on mute. Oh, it's okay. Um, 
about yeah. con continuous support. Um, I'd yeah. say that I mean it's 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 very important that your your still that your staff feel supported. Um, otherwise, you could have um, adoption issues. You know, people may start out of the gate, um, you know, all gung ho about utilizing the software, but if they see any areas where they don't feel supported, uh, then you know they will quickly uh, abandon their uh, their adoption. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's a couple, this applies in a couple ways, right? Like one, making sure that you have the inter internal resources on your team to support your team. And then two, making sure whatever system you're using, uh, as far as the CMMS goes, is that you have adequate support there as well. So if it gets like twofold, um, you know, looking for things like making sure your CMMS company has 24-7 support and you have a dedicated customer support person. Like those are all really important things to look for in a CMMS, but also making sure they can supply you with the resources you need to be able to continuously support your team and, and help them. Um, Brian, do you have anything to add to this one? Yeah. So uh, Upkeep has all of those things. Um, and we actually go, <laughs> we actually go above and beyond that and have, have a... Uh, have a dedicated dedicated resources associated per industry per expertise um, that we can align ourselves with and then align you with and um, you know 24 7 365 support is 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 something that's not offered nearly anywhere and uh, I, I know I've been on the waterfront at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and uh, if there's an issue that I have I want to be able to know that I can talk to somebody or I can get some form of feedback uh to, to lead the way there and then the, the the last thing is in your uh implementation and discovery session it's it's very wise to start having conversations about who's going to be your system champion and that's kind of what garrett and amissa said is that internal your own team have somebody who is trained the trainer or very familiar or someone whose job essentially it is is to keep the cmms quest alive uh so so identifying training and and having somebody like that on your team is very beneficial. Thanks, Brian. All right, step seven is recognizing and celebrating successes. This is one of my favorites because it's so important for building a positive work culture, motivating positive behaviors and creating team competition, healthy team competition. Um, Brian, what are some ways you have celebrated team success in the past? Sure. Yeah. So I'm huge on um, not following company rules uh, when it comes to these types of things. So uh, every time in the, in the past that I've managed departments or whatever, uh, CMMS was always a friendly competition. We would always evaluate technicians' uh, completion times, their 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 work order charges, their parts accuracy, their work order accuracy, uh, and we would we would aggregate that at the end of every month. And to see who had the most accurate, complete, and detailed work orders from all the different standpoints. Um, and then that person would get a day off. They could pick a day, we'd plan it out, uh, and they'd get a day off. And it became a very, very well recognized, friendly competition. So not only are you creating camaraderie amongst your teammates, but you're also building a checks and balances. So technicians are actively thinking about the accuracy and the input of their work orders and of the work that they're, they're, they're scheduled and, and um, planned for. And um, they love it. It's not about me telling them what to do. It's about them uh, managing themselves and wanting to see a goal and wanting to see an outcome of their, their, the fruits of their labor. Right? So that's a, a very common thing I've done at many organizations and uh, it was very, very well received. Yeah. That sounds like it would be. I, I really like how, too, that the things you're celebrating and the things you're looking at to measure success by are also um, reinforcing behaviors to reach department objectives. So, it, you know, that's also, I think, important to mention is like that the things that you are celebrating are the bit are encouraging and driving the behaviors that you're wanting to see. Sure. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and at maturity levels three and four, that's really what we're after. We're not about yeah. just using the system anymore, right? We're about deriving mm -hmm. value from the system and that comes from human, correct human input. Yeah, awesome. Um, Garrett, do you have any advice on what kind of criteria or metrics can be used to recognize successes? I know Brian mentioned some, but do you have any uh, that you can think of? Uh, I found in my experience that um, one of the best things you can do is have your team share success stories um, not only does it highlight positivity regarding the CMMS, but it also exemplifies other um, the ways other team members are utilizing it, which of course mm -hmm. leads to increased adoption. 
Yeah, I like that. Okay. Step eight and the final step of level three of the maintenance maturity model is monitoring and adjusting. So this step is about continuous improvement and being able to be flexible and grow. In this step, you can, you can use metrics, analysis, feedback collection, and examine benchmarks against team objectives to make needed adjustments. Um, Brian, how important is this step in realizing full utilization of the CMMS? Well, I mean, you, you have to know where you were in order to know where you want to be. And uh, it's okay to, to take a step back and say, hey, maybe we're not doing something right. We have to be honest in, in, the, in the reality of what's happening with our CMMS and its utilization and adoption. So if there's things that are recognized, you know, we need to be actively correcting those things. And that comes in all forms. Uh, the way maybe, maybe the, work, the work order uh, layout is not working right and people are missing things. Or maybe we have the wrong drop downs or maybe we have asset nomenclature that's mismatched. Or maybe our asset nomenclature is too complicated and new technicians, they're not understanding a string of random and, you know, alphanumeric things when it should be a different thing. Right. Um, so it's just, it's really important to, to look at these things honestly and to know that it's okay to self-correct and to go back and change it, Because if you don't with the CMMS, the longer you wait, the more things you have that are, are uh, wrong or mismatched and it's that much harder to go back and, and, and change them. So immediate correction is what's valuable, recognizing and then correct. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> and uh, Garrett, do you have anything to add here? I would just say that, you know, it, it's important to get feedback um, from everyone that touches the CMMS at this stage. Okay. All right. So to sum up uh, level three, the keys to successful CMMS adoption lie in ongoing training, effective communication, team engagement, continuous support, and a commitment to improvement. Now that we've explored the steps of fully utilizing and having successful CMMS adoption, let's move into level four of the maintenance maturity model, uh, which we call reliable data and defined KPIs. So level four of the maintenance maturity model is all about achieving re those reliable data in your system and defining what your KPIs are. So to fully realize level four, there are some key steps that need to be taken in order to ensure reliable historical data and robust KPIs for decision making and goal setting. So step one is to make sure you have a foundation for reliable maintenance data. So quality data helps make better utilization and planning decisions. A few ways to check on the quality of your data is by doing a data quality assessment, creating an SOP, a stand, standard operating procedure, when it comes to entering data into the system and cleaning up data that's already in the system when you notice that there's some um, inaccuracies. Um, all right, so we're gonna take a little pause and I have another question for the audience. Are you guys ready? On a scale from one to 10, how would you rate the quality of your current maintenance data? One being, I don't trust it at all. 10 being, I have no doubts. It's all accurate. <clears throat> there not be any 10s in here. <laughs> you're in the wrong webinar if you're at 10. <clears throat> or maybe you should be running the webinar, anyone that has a 10. <laughs> Do we have any answers popping up yet? Yeah, five, Brian? sevens, eight, seven, five, six, five, six. Oh, that actually sounds higher than what I was thinking. Eight, one. Oh. One. Oh. All right. Well, we appreciate your candidness. And actually, I am a little bit surprised. It's, it's a little bit higher than what I was thinking. Average. Um, all right, Garrett, do you have any tips on making sure a team can have high quality, reliable data in their CMMS? Yes. Uh, I mean, everyone knows the old saying, you, you can't track what you're not tracking. Uh, so in my experience with CMMS is you do have the ability to customize your forms. So, you know, make sure that you're adding fields that you want to track to the forms. And then also uh, take advantage of controlling field behaviors. You know, if you have a field where you're looking for a value of like, a, you know, let's say a pressure or a temperature, um, make sure that uh, you can only enter numerics um, in there, no text. Mm, okay. And um, Brian, I know you've used CMMS yourself at past jobs. What's the importance of data integrity? Uh, there's no reason to have a CMMS if you're not going to uh, exemplify data integrity. It's CMMS's data. 
Uh, and I know we're in maturity level three and four, but uh, this all starts at, 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 at the implementation stage and really getting that, uh, that foundation and those reps in for ensuring that the things you're putting in and you want to leverage are there for them to, to interact with and all the right things are going in. Data quality is huge. Like I said, if you're in the process of switching a CMMS, don't think of it as starting at uh, zero, you're starting at 50%. You're given an opportunity to, to refresh, to, to revisit a lot of things when you're switching over. Um, there's a, there's just a lot there. And, um, CMMS is work management and data collection. So if you're not doing those things, the inputs of those things, right, you're going to get nothing out of it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Step two. Um, in step two, teams start using historical data for time allocation. So being able to use data to identify time intensive tasks will help you allocate resources more effectively and improve productivity. Brian, what are some tips for using data to more effectively manage time and resources of a team? So the first thing you do uh, is make sure you're, you're, you're really, really focusing on man hours. You, there's so much that can be derived from, from, from uh, leveraging the data from what your technicians are physically doing. So from the inception of a work order where they're signing on to a work order and the timer starts to how they break up that time within the work order, um, there's so much that can be derived from that because likely what you're going to find is that the amount of hours that you're paying for a technician in his salary or hourly wage is not anywhere near what they're actually turning in time. So for instance, the capacity of a technician um, should, you know, should be near 80, 85% of their actual work time. So we can't say hundred percent. We'd love that, but that's not reality, right? So if they're there for, if they're there for 10 hours, they should have eight and a half hours worth of work orders. And then those work orders should be able to be broken down into what was, what was happening, what parts were associated, all that stuff. You'll find that man, there's more waste in manpower than anything else. Um, so I like to, I like to focus on manpower, uh, metrics and things like that. Spare parts is another one, but, um, without, without getting too crazy, uh, man, manpower is, is, is a huge one. Nice. Okay. And, um, Brian, do you have any thoughts about this one or I'm sorry, yes. Garrett? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it, echoing exactly what Brian said there. Uh, you know, if you, you, you got the data captured, right, we're flagging labor on uh, work orders. Um, and then if you if you can compare labor times on similar job types, you can identify gaps in training and knowledge between your team mm. members. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, moving to step three. This is when you start assessing your asset performance using historical data. So based on the asset, you can implement and define metrics for asset evaluation and get to the point where you're using this data to proactively prevent issues. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts about assessing asset performance? Well, asset performance is going to give you your, your life cycle metrics, right? You know, it's your uptime, your downtime, your costs associated with spare parts, with retrofits, with capital improvements. Um, you know, so the performance of an asset is, uh, is a leading and a lagging thing. Uh, so we're, we're constantly planning to improve the asset performance, right? Uh, but we also need to be looking back at its performance to then make better improvements and make more informed decisions later on. It's also important um, when, you're, when you're going to, uh, to other stakeholders to try to gain any kind of influence or capital expenditure or something, um, that you you leverage the asset performance. Say, hey, look, we've been we've we've put this many man hours, this much spare parts, this much downtime into X machine. The replacement asset value is this much. So we could have been we could have been buying a brand new machine every year for how much we spend mm -hmm. on maintaining this machine. Um, I don't, I'm not really predictive maintenance is condition based maintenance, uh, but you know you can leverage condition based maintenance um, to to assist in your asset performance from remote monitoring to uh, you know, uh, vibration, temperature, all those different things. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. All right. Step four is understanding the financial impact. So at this step, you're doing cost analysis using data and optimizing your budgets. Brian, what can you tell us about doing cost analysis using data from a CMMS? Uh, so you can look at, there's a, there's a handful of things like this is a deep question, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
But like I always say, you can look at your, your manpower costs, what you pay per man hour in respect to what you're actually achieving in work completed or capacity. Um, you can look at connecting your expense spare parts and your balance sheet spare parts with your financial system and having an open and, and clear communication with your financial team or your accounting team to understand uh, those types of things. And then, of course, you have you're tracking any time, any type of real downtime cost, like meaning you know what it costs when a machine is not operating at its peak or people are standing by, you have wasted manpower, missed opportunity. Um, those are all things that you can leverage from a CMMS and tie them to the bigger business for better uh, uh, decision making. Uh, Garrett, do you have anything to add about understanding financial impact using a CMMS? Yeah, you know, um, echoing again what, what Brian said, um, in order to, to do those things, you need to First off, set yourself up for success. Uh, what I mean by that is identify what's important to you and the executive team early on in your CMMS journey, and then be sure you're capturing the data you will need uh, to accomplish that goal. Okay, thank you. All right, my favorite step of level four is this one, step five. I get excited about KPIs, otherwise known as key performance indicators, because they help us evaluate our performance and can guide us to staying on track to hit goals. It's important to make sure that the KPIs you have set align with your company's goals and that they are realistic and are based on industry standard benchmarks. I like using um, SMRP as a resource for understanding what those benchmarks are or could be. Um, Brian, do you have any tips for setting department KPIs? Uh, just what you said, uh, without mm -hmm. getting into extreme detail with the nuance of each indiv individual business, they need to be attainable, they need to be realistic, and they need to be in alignment with the bigger business. If you don't know what your bigger business is trying to do, whether it's the your location or your work area or your actual whole business is trying to do, and you're trying to build KPIs, I suggest you stop and figure out what the business is trying to achieve and align your KPIs with that business. Yeah. Garrett, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, I would like to just, you know, say, make sure that they're attainable. I mean, it's okay to establish a stretch goal every once in a while. Uh, but, you know, if, if, you're, if your team isn't hitting their goals and because they're unreachable, then again, you're going to, you're going to lose buy-in mm -hmm. and morale will, will suffer as well. Okay. I didn't think of that. That's a good one. All right. Step six. Um, which is the final step of level four. This is when you actually implement data driven decision making. So making sure you have um, the decision making framework that utilizes your data and KPIs is very important. Also keep in mind that this needs to be an iterative process. Uh, Brian, what is your experience with uh, implementing data driven decision making? So I try to I try to always align uh, my data with other departmental data. So for instance, if I'm tracking uh, downtime or availability, I want to make sure that the data that I'm capturing is in alignment with operations because most of the businesses I've worked for operations is just as curious and just as interested in downtime as, as I am for, for a different reason, of course. But I like to make sure that I have uh, an, an alignment with all types of data. And that leads me to a plug, which is Data Hub, Upkeep's Data Hub. <clears throat> so Data Hub is a, is, you know, Upkeep is not just a CMMS company. We're a multi-platform solutions provider. And we have CMMS, we have Data Hub, we have Edge. So Edge is sensor technology. Data Hub is where all of these things can feed into. And then essentially you're creating data-driven decision-making through the business. And essentially it creates one form of language for your business. And uh, it can use AI, machine learning, um, financial in, uh, inputs, everything. So what I mean, where I'm going with all this is data-driven decision-making needs to be in alignment with all aspects of the business. So if I'm mm -hmm. saying there's 10 hours of downtime and that costs this much money, but operations and safety is saying it's a 400 hours of downtime, right? We're not getting anywhere. We need to be speaking the same language and we need to be looking at very similar data to make informed decisions. Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, that's, that's all, when we talk about asset operations, we talk about aligning all the departments together. So you're all looking at one, you know, unified set of metrics and you're all on the same page. And that's, that's the aspiration. And, and we really try to help people get to that level. It also, it also helps <clears throat> with, with your buy-in, your further business buy-in. If your objectives mm -hmm. are in alignment with multiple departments, it's that much 
easier and that much harder for someone to to ignore it, right? If I'm just in the maintenance right. department, I'm saying there's all these problems, but operations, safety, quality is saying, no, that's not really, a, that's not real. Well, then now I have to argue that. But if I mm. connect all these people together and we're making the same, as you said, we're making the same decisions based on the same data sets with some, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some contrast, right? But mm -hmm. it's that much easier to get the things you need. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So in conclusion, level four signifies a strategic shift, leveraging historical data and KPIs for maintenance excellence. Reliable data, time allocation insights, asset performance, financial clarity, defined KPIs, and data-driven decision-making are pivotal for success at this level. Also, it's important to note that the process isn't static, but represents a continuous cycle of improvement. Um, all right, so before we jump into Q&A, which is coming up next, I wanna mention that this presentation is a general overview of level three and four. So if you'd like more detailed guidance, you can download our guides. Um, our colleague Kobe, he's been in the chat posting some links um, to those. Also, you can join us next month when we present on the final step of the maintenance maturity model, level five, which is achieving world-class maintenance. So keep your eyes out for that invitation. All right, now let's get into some Q and A. What do we got here? Do we have any questions? Go ahead and type in questions if you have them now. I haven't been paying attention to the comments, so we'll have to scroll through and see if there's any in there. <clears throat> um, all right, Greg. Greg has a good question for us. Greg, Greg's always at our webinars. We love Greg. <laughs> How do the KPIs differ for maintenance versus leadership C-suite? Um, any thoughts about that, Brian or Garrett? Well, we have to think about the lens. Uh, Greg is, uh, just for everybody listening, Greg uh, Christensen is the host of CMMS Radio, uh, and he's also an upkeep ambassador that helps us with CMMS implementation, discovery sessions, and, and uh, best practices. Um, but I think it comes down to optics. You know, uh, the, the, the working level of the organization is looking at things very differently than possibly the C-suite or the executive suite or the leadership team. And uh, it's super important to ensure that those KPIs are connected to the optics of those C-suite people. So for instance, if you have a, uh, if you have an uptime metric, you need to make sure that uptime metric is associated with a dollar sign uh, when you're communicating with the C-suite. So yeah, we have 10 hours of downtime, but what does that actually cost? Um, vice, same thing with safety, same thing with operations, right? So it's all about the optics and how people view the organization. Okay. Um... This is a more general question. Uh, Davis was asking how long the free trial is. Well, if you want to sign up for a free trial of Upkeep, it's uh, it's two weeks, 14 days, basically. If you click on the link, you can sign up there. Um, Ahmed, how long does it take for, imp for implementing or loading the Upkeep software? I mean, lead time to start Upkeep once a customer has agreed to using Upkeep. So I guess maybe like implementation timeline is, is what that sounds like. Maybe Garrett, you probably have some insight to that. Yeah, depending on um, what level you choose, we do have two different levels of implementation. And, you know, that's driven by your subscription level and how many areas of the product you'll be touching. Uh, so generally, you can uh, figure one, uh, at least one, if not two months uh, for the onboarding process. Okay. All right, I'm scrolling through here to see if I missed any questions earlier on. <clears throat> Does upkeep have resource load balancing capabilities? I don't actually know what that no. question means. Garrett, do you know what that means? That, that, <laughs> well, I do, and, and it's a no, like Brian said, Brian, take it. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a no, but so, so I, I think there's something similar where you can see uh, the relationship between you know, on a graph, open, closed, and on hold work orders. Uh, so that's somewhat kind of like a capacity understanding, but as far as like, in-depth types of analysis, the answer is probably no. Okay. Um, we had a question earlier on, um, is there any training courses on upkeep to get the new users onboarding? Garrett, maybe you know. Um, the short answer is yes to that. I mean, there, there are, uh, in our FAQ section, there are links to uh, recordings that were held previously. Um, and then, 
depending on where you are in your upkeep journey, you know, when you become a customer with um, upkeep, uh, depending again on your subscription level, you may receive a custom training from your uh, C CSM. So that would get your team uh, definitely up to speed. <laughs> Yeah, we also have um, a free, what we call Upkeep Certified. They're free courses that anybody can take and it just walks you through um, learning Upkeep and how to use it. And so that's also probably a good way. And then you actually get like a certification at the end of it that you're an expert in using Upkeep. Um, so that could be another resource uh, as well. Uh, let's see, still scrolling for more questions here. <clears throat> uh, all right, I'm not, I'm not really, I don't know, I might have missed some if I miss them. Sorry, we'll reach out to you afterwards if, with, uh, if we didn't answer your question. Um, but at this point, yeah, webinars come to a conclusion. We really appreciate all of you being here. We really hope that you found value um, in the information that we're providing. And please do look out for our um, uh, our invitation to next month's webinar, which is the final epitome, right? World achieving world-class maintenance. And, uh, we're going to be diving into that next month. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you, Brian and Garrett for speaking today. Very welcome. Yep. Uh, yeah, pleasure to be here, Missa. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.